Brother Eli, would you collect the Sunday school offering, please? Knox. 
all the armies in England. Why would Mary, Queen of Scots, fear all the armies in the world, uh, all the armies of England? Uh, let me back up. I'm getting tongue tied. Why would Mary, Queen of Scots, fear the prayers of John Knox, and that kind of right, more than all the armies in England? We can say it's because of prayer, which it was, Brother Eli. But there was something more going on that she didn't realize. I'm sure John Knox spent time in fasting. If we get serious with God, it's not just prayer, but we couple it with fasting because it shows that we are sacrificing of ourselves that God may bring forth the answer. <coughs> From there we talked about the armor and the importance of the armor. How much of the armor does the Word of God instruct us to put on? The whole armor of God. We are to put on the whole armor of God. Why not just the shield? Why not just take the breastplate? Why not just have the sword? Because where is our enemy coming from? All around us. How many enemies are coming against us possibly at one time? Many. There might be one. There might be two. But there could be many as well. The soldier who puts on the whole armor is ready for an attack from any from any defense, from any position. If he has just something going to protect the front, that's not going to help if the enemy sneaks up on him. That takes them by surprise. And does the enemy come in sometimes and then um, surprise us? He does. And he comes in from the back. But if we have the whole armor on, then we're ready for it. Why don't we just put on the breastplate and take the shield or just put on the shoes? Because for the individual who's just standing there taking the blows of the enemy, he's not doing anything to fight back. There's really nothing to fight back with. But God said, put on the whole armor of God. What is the whole armor? It is the breastplate so that we can um, be protected, that our vital organs are protected. Take on the shield, which is a defensive weapon to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. But you realize in times of battle when the sword was gone, the shield was also a defensive weapon? It wasn't just offensive, it was also defensive. I might have that backwards. But you take the, the sword. That is a defensive weapon. It's not just offense. And the shield of faith. So it's not to put on the armor that we can be the devil's punching bag and just take the blows and do, oh Lord, I'm doing everything I can to stand. Well, sometimes the response from heaven is, you need to fight back too. We need to put on the whole armor of God that we may be ready to stand against any attack of the enemy. Today we're going to be looking at the belt of truth. We find that from Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 14. If someone would please, before you read it, go ahead and read Ephesians 6, 14. But someone else also read John 14, 6. John 14, 6. So how do you um, gird up your loins? How do you gird your loins? I have my loins girded right now. Some of us have plumbers, and we wish that they had the loins girded a little bit more. How about John chapter 14 and verse 6? Do you know what the most important piece of the armor is? Probably the belt. Why is the belt the most important piece of the armor? Because it's what holds everything together. It's what keeps the breastplate and everything from wobbling around. It's what keeps it off. If you have it, that kind of defensive down below the chain mail from wobbling all around, it's what keeps everything together. <coughs> You don't want to be fighting in a war and have everything just flopping all over the place. You don't want to have anything lose. You want to be able to move swiftly if possible. When we look at the belt, it's not just that it held everything together, but it also held important items. It held the sheath to the sword. Maybe it held a dagger. In times of a person traveling, it held their money purse. In essence, if you took the belt off, everything they owned probably fell to the ground. Because that's where everything was tucked. 
for guys today, and probably most of us in here, we can all relate. How many things do we put on our belts? Normally, I'll carry my cell phone on my belt. I'll carry my pocket knife on my belt. Some people attach their wallets to their belt. A belt is a handy tool. If you're working, you might slip your hammer into it so it doesn't go anywhere. Your tape measures go in there. Perhaps you'll slip that pen in there that you're always losing because if you put it in your back pocket, you're going to sit on it and there goes the pencil. You put it in your ear and it disappears somewhat. That's why when we're working, we end up with a million pencils. We have some where we're working, some down below. Why? Because we went there and forgot. We went downstairs to get the board, we forgot. And there are many other different tools that people store in the belt. Some people store um, pocket watches on the belt. A belt is a very handy tool. If a child misbehaves, what's the sound you hear? As it's coming out, a belt is a handy, handy tool. And it is probably one of the most important pieces, if not the most important, of the armor of God. As I've already said, over the years, the belt has had many different effects on people. For, set, for some people, it meant not being able to sit for a while because of a wrongdoing. For others, it is the staple attire of their outfit. Some women, they like belts. Why? Because maybe it pulls everything together. I don't know. But belts are used for many different reasons. Ever go into a place and they say, if your pants are sagging, don't come in? What do you need? You need a belt to hold it all together. A belt is very important for different reasons. In times of the ancients, when we go back to the Romans and everything, the belt was very ornate. It was during times of war, it was probably made of steel to hold everything together. It was very, very important. It was decorative. Perhaps if you were a soldier at war, the more ornate it was, it showed your class status because you were able to afford a more expensive belt. Maybe it was decorated or plated with gold or brass. It was a symbol of status. When we look at the belt in the Word of God, it reveals the readiness of an individual. Where do we get that from? If someone would please read Luke chapter 12 and verse 35. Luke 12, 35. And if someone else would find Exodus 12, 11 and just hold that. Exodus 12, 11. So you're supposed to have your loins girded about. You're supposed to be have a belt on, ready to travel. What did God instruct the Israelites in Exodus chapter 12 and verse 11? So we're looking here at the Passover. And God instructed them to have that lamb ready, have the blood applied to the doorposts there in Egypt, and that night they were supposed to stay inside and eat the Passover lamb. But God instructed them to have their shoes on and their loins girded, have their belt on. Be, why? Because it showed that they were ready to travel. And we know that's exactly what happened after the Passover there in Egypt when the death angel passed over. Egypt basically said, get out of here. And they had to get up, pack up, and move. However, from there on out, whenever the Passover was eaten, that's how they ate it, with their shoes on and their belt ready, loins guarded, as a remembrance that they were to eat it and be ready to travel. It shows that they were ready for the Lord's move. When we look at the believers belt in this armor, is it something physical? No, the believers belt is not physical, but rather it's spiritual. It's part of that spiritual armor that God gives us. And its composition is not that of metal. But what does Ephesians 6, 14 tells us that our belt is made out of? Our 
belt is made out of truth. Now we are living in a day and age where truth seems to be relevant. So if our belt is made out of truth, whose truth is it made out of? When we look in the book of John chapter 18 and verse 38, if someone please read that, John 18 and verse 38. John 18, 38. Pilate saith unto him, What is true? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews, and saith unto them, I find in him no fault at all. So what's happening in this passage? It is the trial of Jesus. And who is Pilate speaking to? speaking to Jesus. And what is Jesus' status? Why, well, he's the Son of God. When we look here at this passage, man is asking God, what is truth? Pilate, man, has Jesus some trial in front of him, but he is asking Jesus, what is truth? Our belt is not composed of man's truth. It is composed of God's truth. Let me say that again. Our belt is not composed of man's truth, but it is composed of God's truth. Man thinks many, many things. And man holds many, many things as truth that really are not true. As Christians, what's one thing we have to weed out? Brother Peterman and Sister Peterman probably have to do this more than we do right now since they're homeschooling. But when you're going through listening to man's truth and man's science, we have to weed out the billions and millions of years. We have to weed out the crustaceous period. We have to weed out the Jurassic period. Why? Because they didn't exist. Those are all man-made. When we compare them to the Word of God, they didn't exist. How do we know they, that they didn't exist? Because when we look at the Word of God and study it out, the Bible itself proves that the earth is only about 6,000 years old. No matter how much science man throws out there, there are still things out there that evidence that Earth is only about 6,000 years old. Despite what all their other research does, I know years and years ago, they were saying that at the rate that the Earth magnetic field is decaying, that if you would trace it back to a strongest point where life could survive, it only states that life could be only about 6,000 years old. But they have to throw in the millions and millions of years somewhere. God's truth is true. Man's truth is flawed. How do we know there wasn't a Crustaceous period? How do we know that there wasn't a Jurassic period? Because in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the heaven and the earth was all destroyed by a flood. And on that boat that Noah built came dinosaurs as well. Not during the Jurassic period, not during the Crustaceous period, but they all lived at one time. Man's truth is flawed. God's truth is perfect. And our belt is composed of truth. And what is God's truth in John chapter 14 and 6? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way the truth, and the life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth. Jesus is truth. Our belt is composed of truth. Jesus is the word of God. He is the living word of God. This is the written word of God. That is truth. Our belt is composed of truth. Like I said, not man's truth, but God's truth. Truth seems to be relative, and people like to believe whatever they want. And we are living in that day and age. 
There's, and it's no secret. One thing that gives me about one of the pastors of the largest church in America is that he said that he never preached on sin. Why? Because it's negative. And he doesn't want to leave his people with a negative effect. He's not giving them the whole truth. He's only giving them part of it. Do you remember what happened to, um, I can't remember his name, but the founder of the Jehovah Witnesses? He preached so sternly against hell at the beginning. But as life went on, his theories changed, his beliefs changed to the point where his favorite sermon was that there was no hell. That's not truth. Uh, one time he knew truth, but he no longer knew truth at that point in his life. Or how about let's go to the 1800s with Schofield and other Christians out there that they wanted to make science adapt to the Bible. And if evolution is true, well, then gen there's something to be wrong in Genesis, and where can we make it fit? And now we get the gap theory, which isn't true. Because it adds to the Word of God. God's truth is pure. But man's truth perverts the Word of God, and it cheapens the Word of God. Would someone please read Matthew chapter 7, verse 27 through... Excuse me. Matthew 20... I'm all tongue-tied. Matthew 7, verses 24 through 27. Matthew 7, 24 through 27. When we found truth upon the Word of God and the Word of God solely, we are building our house upon the rock. And who is the rock upon which we're building? Jesus Christ. And the bell is composed of truth, so when we build upon that rock, and that, if that rock is Jesus Christ, by simulation, according to what we read in John chapter 14, verse 6, we are building that upon Jesus Christ because he said, I am truth. And when we're built upon truth, the entire world can come against us. And we can stay firm because we know where we're anchored. We know where our roots are planted. And they're planted in Jesus Christ. Will it always be easy if it gets to that point? Absolutely not. But, it's, oh, I shouldn't say that. Sometimes it is. If we're really truly found upon the Word of God, sometimes it's not a hard decision. The consequences might be hard, but it's not a hard decision. Do you remember what Leonard Raven Hill said about a man... A man who is intimate with God will never be intimidated by man. Why? Because he's founded his truth upon the Word of God. He is solid and firm in his belief and his convictions. He knows <laughs> what is truth, and he will not adhere to the false or perverted truth of this world. If we go back to Elijah, he was a man who knew what truth was. And if we go to Mount Carmel, he didn't have one person standing against him. He didn't have two people standing against him. He didn't have three people standing against him. He didn't have 50 people standing against him. He didn't have 400 people standing against him. But they were Mount Carmel. You remember how many prophets of Baal there were? What's that? I think there was 850, if I remember correctly. If I remember correctly, it was 850. 850 prophets of Baal. So were there 850 pro uh, people standing against Elijah on that day? Technically, there was at least 851 because off in a castle somewhere was Jezebel. That's a lot of people to be standing against. And what does Elijah's composure look like on Mount Carmel? When he's standing by himself, or at least he feels like he's standing by himself. Is he off in the corner somewhere praying for God? God, you got to do this. You know, sometimes... God will lay something on our heart and tell us to do something and say, God, you need to do this because if I don't, 
not going to be just me looking like an idiot. It's going to be you looking like an idiot, too. If you don't heal this person like you said you're going to, or if you do this. But if we look at Elijah's composure, is he off praying in the corner? I don't get that picture from Elijah on Mount Carmel. Is he hiding under a shade tree? I don't get that picture of Elijah. Now, I realize I'm a little bit different. I've been told that. But rather, I get the image of Elijah almost sitting in his lazy boy recliner with a soda on hand, maybe with his sippy straw too, a bag of Doritos, sitting there watching the prophets of Baal put on a show. All 850 people that's coming against him. And they're crying out, and he's just saying, yep, yep, cry a little bit louder. Cry a little bit louder. You know what? Maybe your girl's off in the toilet somewhere. Maybe you have to get a little bit busier. Maybe he's on a smartphone. you got to get across and loud that from what was a candy crush or whatever. Maybe he's sitting down playing it. But we do not get the image of a man who is intimidated by any means, no matter how many people are coming against him. And we know that there's at least 851 people coming against him that day. When we are founded upon the truth of God's word, and we know who that truth is backed up by, there's no reason for us to fear or waver. Because we know what is holding our armor together. We know what is holding our sword by our side. We know who has our money purse. It is all being held together by the truth of God's word. And it's not perverted in any way. When man perverts God's word, that's when he has to start making excuses for it. And that's when he has to start making an answer for this or making an answer on that. And he starts relying upon man's wisdom. And what does that passage that I believe Mom just read with the wise man, the foolish work man state? The foolish man built his house upon what? Sand. The sand. And what happens when the storm comes against the sand? It falls. Ask those who had houses on the sand there in Florida. I mean, some of them probably didn't lose how, uh, just roofs, but they might have more destruction, more wind damage, maybe more water damage. Maybe they were missing some windows or something. Maybe the house was no longer there. Why? Because it was built on something that shifted, something that changed. When you build your foundation upon the sand, as that change, sand shifts and stuff, there goes your foundation. And if you lose your foundation, there goes the rest of the structure. Our whole armor is built on truth. And we need to determine what that truth is. If it's not the word of God, well then we've perverted our armor. It's not going to hold. Can you imagine going to war in the Middle Ages with weak armor? Is that going to be, would that be your ideal situation for a soldier? If that was your life on the line. You want to weaken your armor in some spot. Or maybe it has some cracks in it. Or maybe it's missing a chunk right here. You don't want to go into war with weak <coughs> armor. Why? Because you're susceptible to the attack of the enemy. You want to go out there with the best armor possible. You want something that you know is going to protect your life at any cost. And there's only one thing that's going to do that. That is the Word of God. When it comes to our life, there will be many say, Lord, Lord, have we not done this and have we not done that? Who are those men and women? Those are men and women who cheapened their armor, who had maybe partial truth. They had the part of God work, God's work, but they want to do what they wanted. Or they pervert maybe part of it. And they believe this or they believe that. And Thought it was okay to maybe go out and eat up, smoke some cigarettes and go to the bar and drink some beers. And they didn't listen to the word of God. Or they were those that went to the uh, work every day and told the dirty jokes and this and that. And they didn't listen to the word of God. They weakened their armor. They cheapened it. Why? Because they built it upon.